able to use uh, to invent your own word to describe a certain uh, person or uh, no, element. No. No, it, it isn't. If 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 the woman has got a big backside, you can put it in. You can just say that. You know, you don't need to to make up the word. So you know, if if um if you want to say something, then just say it. You know, a physical a physical attribute is a physical attribute. Yeah. So if you say that somebody is well endowed in the right places or whatever, you just say it. Yes. And if you want okay. a short. If you want to, to put it in slang, if you want to say so and so has got a big ask, then that's okay. Um, it's all part of the the the, the story uh, uniqueness, if you like. Okay. But to but to make up a word like asthmatic doesn't work because a, a, re a reader in the UK would say, well, what is this? This person has has not spelt correctly asthmatic. Whereas if the guy wants, if the author wants to say, this woman had a big booty, then that would be okay because the reader would say, I understand this. Yeah. Okay. But, but making up words always risks um, a reader saying, well, this person just hasn't spelt it correctly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, the other thing I've mentioned later on in the slide is think of the audience that you have in mind. So, you know, if if you're writing for a Kenyan author, uh, audience that understands slang and particular words, then fine, use those words. But if you're writing for a foreign audience, think to yourself, would they understand this? Yeah. Yeah. So, so always think to yourself, who is the audience? That's got to be the big driver. You know, here here in the UK we have thousands of slang words, but if I took that slang word and used it in as near as let's say France, or if I used it in Australia or Canada, people would say, "Well, we don't understand what that is." because it's a uniquely British slang word. So you always have to think, who is the reader? Where are they based? Yeah? Yeah. OK, so if we've not got any questions, uh, colons and semicolons, I don't want to go into this in great detail, but what this is getting at, if we, we step back a little bit, what this is really getting at is, uh, appearance of the story again. A semicolon and a colon is a way of breaking up a sentence. So some of the, um, Jimmy, uh, welcome to the workshop. I've just seen you join and it's uh, it's good to, good to see you. Um, some of the stories that I've looked at, there'll be a paragraph and it's just one long sentence. So when you look at a sentence, ask yourself, is this too long? Can I break it? And you can either break it with a full stop or break it with a colon or a semicolon, which is just a couple of dots. But it adds to the sense that this is a polished piece of work. Yeah, It's the visual appearance. It's the ability to use punctuation and grammar, uh, which is so important because it gives the impression uh, that this is a polished professional piece of work. So have a look at these two uh, clips on YouTube. We, we won't look at them now. I'll leave them with you um, because they are brilliant and they're about six minutes long and they show how to use colons and semicolons. I never knew how to use these. Uh, but once, once I started using them, uh, I found that they were very helpful for breaking up paragraphs and breaking up uh, sentences. And you see on that uh, page, on that slide, I say the benefit is the text is broken up. Also adds the sense the author is comfortable with punctuation. So I've looked at some uh, pieces of work that have come through. And there's a lack, a lack of sentence structure. 
and it takes away from the reader's experience. We we should all be aiming for um, workshop or um, bookshop standard uh, presentation. The um, the work that I write, uh, I have um, a proofreader, and whenever I've written something, I sent it to him. He lives in Scotland, and he goes through it and he chops it about and he chops up paragraphs and he puts in semicolons and so on but it adds to the the visual appearance the problem with some pieces of work uh, as you'll all know is that you can read it maybe a dozen times but you can't see what the errors are because you're too close to it so i put in the slide it's a good idea to uh, ask a friend to read through your work and your friend shouldn't be telling you it's a great piece of work they should be telling you where it's weak we all like compliments and being told that our work is good but that doesn't really help us it's by having criticism that we uh, improve a piece of work so anyway, that's just uh, this this um, this set of slides is not about grammar and punctuation. It's just a couple of slides that I put in here to to draw your attention to it, uh, to the importance of presentation, uh, formatting, putting in full stops and commas, and using it uh, wisely. It all adds to the the reader's experience. But the rest of the slides are really about the substance of. Uh, short story writing. As I say, it's not to say that these slides are right or wrong. They're just a particular view. Um, on tense, this was another problem that, that I had with some of the stories that came in because there was a mixing of tenses. So you've got an example here. John uh, had got onto the bus and was out of breath. And then he reads a book uh, as the bus trundles along dusty roads. Well, that's a mixing of tense because you've got the present. You're saying he reads a book when really it should be he read a book as the bus went through the dusty roads. So, again, this is all about appearance um, and, and the work being polished. Important to be consistent in the tense. Uh, are you writing in the present or the past? You can combine these, but it must make sense. Central character may be in a present situation, but thinking back about things he did in the past, people he knew, and so on. Then we have a mixing of tenses, but the reader must be able to tell which is which. So some of the stories that came through from the, um, the Writers Guild uh, Kenya competition, some of the stories had a mixing of tenses, which didn't make sense. One minute it would be in the past, then it would be in the present, and then it would flash back again. So consistency uh, is important. Yeah, anybody got a question? Juliet? Everyone happy? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. I'm okay. <laughs> okay, and as I say, sorry if I'm if I'm pointing out things that you uh, that you already know and you're already ha happy with. So it's. Um, it's just a very general presentation that we've got here. Philip, welcome to the uh, to the workshop. I've seen you just join up. Okay, shall we uh, shall we move on? Character. Now we're looking at the um, the substance of writing a short story. And as I say, please at any point stop me and say I think this is completely wrong, or say this is completely right. Uh, any questions that you've got, then please feel free to to uh, to stop me. Okay, short story is a difficult genre because themes and characters must be developed in a short space of time. Um, there isn't the length available for extended introductions. Now, um, the, the first book I wrote was um, hundreds of pages long. And what that meant was that there, there were some chapters in there which shouldn't have been in there. And some of the, the readers of the book said, um, you could have shortened it by maybe 50 pages. But with a book, you've got the luxury of being able to keep writing. Whereas with a short story, which might be 
a few thousand words long and maybe 20 pages in length, you don't have that freedom. It's got to be a very tightly written piece of work. As a general rule, the story shouldn't be uh, crowded with too many names or characters. Before you begin writing, write some bullet points about this person, some basic qualities. So a good approach when you're writing a short story is to do a map, a short map on one piece of paper where you start off with a central character and you have uh, arrows showing the direction of travel, how the story is going to develop, who you're going to bring in and at what point. So mapping it out beforehand uh, is important. And as I say, with a short story, you don't have the luxury of giving a couple of pages describing this person. It has to be quick and concise. So I've given you an example here. Um, you've got a wealthy man. He's an old person. A physically small, he's a thin man. And his clothes are loose because they're too big for him. He's got a thin face and he looks tired and he's got a scar under his left eye. So you've just got one, two, three, four points, just a couple of sentences and you're already attracting the reader's attention because the reader is looking at this and he's saying, if this guy is wealthy, why is he wearing clothes that are too big for him? Why hasn't he got the latest suit? Why isn't he smartly dressed? So he's thin. He's got a tired face. Why is he tired? Is it his work? Is it his family? So the reader in the first paragraph, you have to introduce a character and immediately put some hints where the reader will say, who is this person? So with those four sentences, they're not even sentences, they're just bullet points. You've already got a mental picture of this person. You can see him standing there, thin, his clothes are hanging, his face is thin, and he's got a scar and you're thinking, how did he get that? So with a short story, Right at the beginning, set the scene. Okay, um, and as I say, with character, um, with a short story, it's got to be precise. It's got to be short. You don't have to spell everything out. You can leave it to the um, reader's imagination. The best short story is one which leaves it to the reader to fill in the gaps. Does that make sense? Everyone happy with that? Okay, well, let's move on to the, uh, the next slide. In just a few words, you started building a character, but without providing too much detail, because you don't need to. You're saying to the reader, it's up to you to create this person in your mind. I'm not going to tell you everything about him. I'm just going to give you a few loose points. The, or the reader already has a picture in his eye for this person. And he's also wondering, well, who is he? If he's wealthy, why is he wearing loose clothes? Is it because he's a mean man? He doesn't like spending money? Or is it because he just couldn't be bothered? He doesn't take care about wealth and appearance. He's comfortable with the way he looks. So when you look at uh, very wealthy people who have known poverty, who started off poor, they have a habit of saying, I don't really care about wealth. I'm not interested in appearance and expensive clothes and so on because I have known poverty. It affects somebody's mental attitude to the world. Why is he looking tired? If he's got money, he should look happy, some would say. He should have a fuller face. Maybe he should be overweight. The image suggests he's not a happy man. Why isn't he happy? Has he got trouble with his family? Has he lost a child? 
And where did he get the scar from? So right at the beginning, in the first few sentences, the reader needs to engage with your central character and not to be over descriptive. So does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. But I have one, uh, I actually belong to, I want to add a little assumption to your first paragraph where yes. you're talking about the person wearing loose clothes. Is First of all, is there anything wrong with loose clothes? <laughs> There's yeah, an yeah, assumption yeah. that... <laughs> <there's> some, <laughs> There's That's an assumption true. that wearing anything loose is a bad idea. And I'm here thinking, whoa, I'm in <laughs> the fashion and design world, some loose, loose clothes actually look good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, uh, Juliet. Yeah, you're quite right. It might be that this guy, he's, um, he, he, his fashion is that he wears loose clothes. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it might be comfortable to wear loose clothes. So, but you're, you're kind of planting the seed in the reader's mind. You're saying there may be many reasons why he's wearing loose clothes. It might be, for example, that his house burnt down the day before and all his clothes, and he's wearing his cousin's clothes because he didn't have anything else to wear. There might be <laughs> many. Yeah, so there might be many different reasons why. But when you look at somebody and uh, they're fairly thin and you know that they're wealthy and they're wearing clothes, I guess I'm, I'm not so much getting at loose clothes, but the idea of clothes hanging on somebody. Um, you know, we, we say here in the UK that clothes hang on somebody because their body is maybe small and the clothes don't suit them. Now, it might be, as you rightly say, Julia, that they just like it that way. They feel more comfortable. But sometimes it's for, for other reasons. So when we see people um, in the street here in, in loose clothes, we tend to think that they're not well. You, know, hmm. you come across somebody and maybe they were clothes that they were wearing a year ago and they're still wearing them now, but they look loose. And it suggests that their body has shrunk a little bit. <laughs> so there, there might be many reasons why. But this is the whole point about a short story. You're adding to not confusion in the reader's mind. You're just saying, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And also fits to the whole idea of context. Because probably if you're writing for a different audience, um, a different setup altogether, there are others who might feel having loose clothing is normal and they might read ahead without not being in suspense of what is wrong with that person. But yes. then like you're saying, if you're writing for the, the Europe audience, then having loose clothing is a bad idea. So again, I'm seeing the, the context applying in your explanation. So yeah, well, I think I, I agree with you. I, I've got friends in Trinidad and um, when we speak, they say, um, we come to the UK and you've all got loose clothing but here in Trinidad, we prefer tight clothing. So it's oh. a kind of, it's almost a cultural thing. Yeah. So clothing, whether it's tight or whether it's loose, can be a cultural thing as well. But the whole point about the short story is to, to engage. So yeah. if the reader's gone past the first paragraph and, and is asking this question, why is this rich person wearing clothes that don't suit him? You've already put the the worm on the hook to catch the fish mm -hmm. okay okay yes okay should we move to the next uh, next um page and maybe, maybe before we go on there is a, a question from monira hussein yes she asks in regards to leaving the reader to feel in some to, gaps where do we draw the line between the plot hole and the suspense? Yeah, um, that, that, that's interesting because you're, you're, you're quite right. If you leave the gaps too open, then the reader will have no sense of focus or direction. So you have to kind of 
steer them in a particular direction, but without forcing them in, in that direction. I guess it's a bit like when you're um, when you have sheep and uh, you, you have sheep on a farm and they're running down a, a field, you can either have uh, two fences on either side and it's very, very narrow so they can just run in one particular direction or you can have a wide lane so they can run about a little bit but they're still running in the same direction. So you have to give some sense of direction. You're absolutely right. If you leave it too open, the reader is going to say, I might as well have written this myself because there are too many gaps. But in the um, in the interview with Sharon um, uh, that I sent round uh, this week, there was an interview with one of our authors. She's put in, in her feedback, she said, um, there's no need, if you're talking about a room, to describe everything in it, because a room is a room. So you say somebody goes into a room, they look around, maybe it's a hot room, a cool room, maybe the wallpaper is old, and maybe it's got wooden floors, but you don't have to go on about it and describe it in a couple of pages. So the reader knows he's in a room and he can fill in the gaps. So I, I guess it's a balance. It's a good question. It's it's a balance. You you must give some sense of direction to the reader, but without holding their hand too tightly. Now they, they don't want to be dragged along, they want to um, use their imagination. Does that answer your question? Yes, is everyone happy with that? Yeah, I think she's unable to respond, but we can be able to get back. Maybe she's she's not unmuted her microphone. Okay. But to proceed. Okay. Should we look at the next slide? Ah, now this is um, this. Uh, I think it's a pre. Yes, that's it. That's it. Now this this paragraph um, is quite a helpful one because it says, as you can see, a character must emerge from the mist quickly in a short story. So the, the story must be very concise and characters must be created quickly. Your description should be concise without overusing words. You don't need flowery language. That's something that we all uh, suffer from. By flowery language, it means that um, why say in 50 words something that you can say in 500 words? It's, there's no point in overwriting or over describing. Uh, use enough words to engage the reader's curiosity. Why use 100 words when 50 will be enough? Rambling descriptions irritate readers. So rambling, it just means you're using too many words. It's not tight enough. This is why using paragraphs is helpful because it gives you you as the read as the the writer it gives you a sense of finality you think i'm going to describe the character in this paragraph and that's it i'm going to leave it so the paragraph structure makes it more concise and to the point and i've given you a um, an example here of another another way of creating um a picture a mental picture but saying to the reader what do you think about this? Are you interested? Do you want to continue reading? And I put in, the woman sat next to the notice board at the airport, waiting for her flight to be called. She pushed back her graying hair, took out bright red lipstick from her expensive handbag, puckered her lips, applied the lipstick, then smiled at a young man seated alongside. Now, that's just a couple of sentences, but it's already giving you a picture of this person. She's got gray hair, so you're thinking, well, she's fairly elderly, 
but she's using bright red lipstick. So it suggests that maybe she's pretending to be younger than she is. She's got an expensive handbag. Well, what does that tell us about her lifestyle? Is she self-made? Is she rich? Is she married to a rich man? And it says she's put on the lipstick and then she smiled at the young man seated alongside. Well, why is she doing that? Did she put on the lipstick for him? Is she trying to find a younger man at the airport? So there you have a couple, three sentences where this person has immediately stepped out of the mist. We see who she is and we're already wondering about her about her background is she wealthy uh, we're wondering why is she interested in this young man is she interested in him so in three sentences we have a character we have a context and we have the reader thinking who is this person what is she doing why is she there why is she at the airport sitting there on her own where is her husband where are her children is she a businesswoman? So it just takes a few sentences to create interest for the reader. So shall we look at the next slide? Uh, please, if anybody is, uh, is not happy about looking at these slides or wants to um, take it in a different way, then please let me know and I'll, I'll change. Everyone happy? OK. Um, so these are the messages in this paragraph. First, she's obviously elderly, but not so old as to be concerned as not to be concerned about her appearance. Uh, why has she allowed her hair to go gray? Why hasn't she dyed it? Um, she's using lipstick. Is she someone who has accepted that she's getting on in years but still wants to make an effort to use lipstick to suggest she's younger than she is? Why is she at the airport? Why is she alone? Where is she going? Is she running away from somebody? Running to somebody? Is she on a business trip? What about the handbag? Why is she used the lipstick? So all I'm trying to get over is the idea of subtlety, that you don't need to use a huge number of paragraphs to whet the appetite of the reader. Just a couple of key words, a couple of subtle descriptions. Bright red lipstick. What is it telling us about her? So be concise, as I say, the short story is a particular genre and you have to be to the point. Okay, shall we look at the next slide? <clears throat> so you can see, just by using a few words, you attract the interest of the reader. You're already triggering questions in his mind. You don't need to be heavy hand handed and use too many words. Keep it simple. Now, how do you describe the dynamics between people? Again, be subtle. You don't need to over explain uh, because we don't have the time and the space in a short story. So I'll have a little look at uh, this sentence. The old man took out a handkerchief, gently pressed it to catch the tear, the single tear falling down the face of the young lady sitting alongside him. So you're looking at that and nobody has said anything. There is no narrative, there is no speech. But what can you say from that sentence? And you're looking at it and you're thinking, there must be an intimacy between them for him to use his handkerchief in this way. So we already know about the relationship between these two characters. In one sentence, we know about their relationship. So she's, she's crying. 
but it's just one tear. She's not sobbing. She's not weeping. It's just one tear. So we're looking at it and we're thinking, this is constrained. This is an uh, emotional constraint. It's a single gesture, but it suggests so much. Clearly, there's intimacy between them, a closeness. Uh, you have to know somebody well before you can use such a gesture. No words spoken. Is it the man's daughter? Or his wife? We don't know. We'll have to read on about that. If I was the reader, I would think, who are they? What is the relationship? Is it um, uh, a love affair between an older person and a younger person? So in one sentence, you've got the intimacy, you've got the relationship, and the reader is already saying, who are they? Why is this person crying? What is their relationship? Yes, does somebody have a question? Everyone happy? Okay, shall we move on? Unless anybody has any uh, questions they'd like to ask. The reader is already thinking, why the tear? And a single tear, why not sobbing? Suggests restrained grief, and um, also that they share it. In one sentence, you sketched an intimacy, deep affection, shared grief, maybe, in a few hundred words. Better to leave it to the reader to visualize, to raise his own questions, and probably to answer them himself. Um, you don't need to lead the reader by the hand. The reader already understands that there is a relationship between these people, and it's a very close one. What about this one? And we've all experienced this. We've all come across it. The young man closed his eyes as the woman alongside continued speaking in a high-pitched tone. His face was calm. And she continued looking out across the shopping mall. Now, how many times have we seen this in shopping centers, airports, and you've got a man or a woman and they're sitting there and they've got their eyes closed, you know they're awake. And you've got somebody alongside who is chat, 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 chatting. And you know that the person's closed his eyes because he doesn't want to listen. And the person alongside doesn't even know that he's not listening. But the fact he's got a calm face suggests he's experienced this before. He's been nagged, if you like, but he doesn't mind. It's part of the dynamics within their relationship. What does this say to us? He's closed his eyes because he probably doesn't want to hear any more. He's probably thinking, she's always doing this. She's always talking about things which I'm not really interested in, uh, but I'm too polite or we love each other and I, I don't want to tell her, will you please be quiet? So I just let her go on and on and on, but I'm going to close my eyes and think about something else. I'm going to think, I wonder who's going to win the football match this evening. No sign of irritation on his face. He looks quite relaxed. Probably because he's used to it. He's accustomed to it. It's part of their relationship. He looks like uh, what we call a henpecked husband. Yeah? It's a husband who's just used to his wife. Talk, 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 talking. But mm. they love each other. So in one or two sentences... You started describing the nature of their relationship. So these, this example and the previous one, they show how in a short story you can achieve so much with so little. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions anybody wants to, to come to?
Okay, then, well, we'll move on to, to our, uh, our next. Our next slide. And in that, uh, the two sentences, um, she hasn't even noticed he's not looking, probably not listening. She continues speaking, takes it for granted he's interested in what she has to say. But here's the point. Neither of them is irritated with the other, and it looks as if they know each other so well, probably for a lifetime. His face is calm. It's because he's accustomed to this, and he's relaxed about it. It's beginning to look as if they're a happily married couple who've been with each other for a lifetime and accept habits in each other which others might not do. Just think of it. If you're talking to somebody and suddenly they just close their eyes, you're probably going to say, that's very rude. I'm talking to you. Why are you closing your eyes? But with a married couple, they might say, this is the way we behave. We're both used to it. Most people get annoyed if someone continued talking when they wanted to rest and to just close uh, their eyes. Most people would be irritated if they're speaking, but the person to whom they're speaking couldn't be bothered to listen. So in a few sentences, you captured the essence of a married couple perfectly at ease in each other's company and put up with each other's ways. So think to yourself, short story, be concise, leave it to the reader to fill the gaps. You don't need to be heavy handed. It's just a couple of words can describe so much. OK. OK, yeah. shall we move on? OK. <clears throat> I'm not sure if this is the way that you usually run your your workshop. So I, I apologize if, um, if if it's not the, the usual way of. Uh, of doing things, but uh, hopefully there, there will be a couple of things that will be of of help and of interest. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are a number of people having questions, but they're noting them down. So I don't know if they're having challenges with unmuting their microphones. But if anyone has a question, you can be able to type in the chat or you can unmute your microphone at any time. You can uh, ask to be excused by Simon and you can be able to jump in. Otherwise, you may also write them somewhere and then at the end of it, you can be able to engage. But I would really suggest that you can be able to interact. Then we can be able to internalize some of the things that we are learning from this. Yeah, pl please, uh, as I say, jump in at any time. If you've got any questions on any slides, just jump in and uh, and we'll have a good uh, chat about it. So a short story should hint at relationships and use words economically. That's a, that's a good word, economically. What it's really saying is don't overwrite. Just hint at things. You don't need to over describe. Leave the questions with the reader. Let him or her use imagination to fill gaps. But subject to the uh, the earlier comment from somebody in the workshop that we've got to have some sense of direction. You can't leave it too blank. So it's a matter of balance. Get the balance right, but not too much detail. Readers like um, subtlety. I've read stories uh, recently and particularly in the um, horror genre, which I really uh, personally, I don't like it at all. And you find that people will describe acts of violence um, in great depth. And they might describe blood all over the place and body parts and goodness knows what else. And you read it and you think this is unnecessary. Uh, description of violence, it doesn't add to anything. So we must be subtle. You can you can describe a violent scenario, but without describing any violent acts within it. You can leave it to the reader to say, I know what happens next. This person is going to get beaten very badly. And it's not described in the story. Um, excuse me, Simon, I, I have a question. Yes, Edith. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, my name is 
Uh, thank you, thank you. So um, just on the context of uh, using words economically, I write um, historical fiction. Oh, I like that. And I really have difficulty with this because if you use words economically, that means that a lot of readers don't know what is going to happen because you have to feed as much information as possible because they are historical accounts. So what do you think about this, especially in this genre? It's tricky in a short story drama. And, and uh, I, I can mention, I, I can uh, understand exactly what you're saying because I, I wrote um, a book set in the Second World War a few years mm -hmm. back. And I wrote about the battlefields and the generals and mm -hmm. locations because I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I sent yeah. it to my I sent it to my proofreader. He said, "Simon, this is too much detail." Oh, wow. And he said, "This has all got to come out. Mm -hmm. You've got to strip it back. If you want to write a history book." Mm -hmm. full of facts this is brilliant and there is a room for that he said to me if you want to write a history book about the second world war then write one mm -hmm. but don't write a story which is really a history book by a different name <laughs> yes well. so you as you rightly say you've got to give some context you've got to say this is the historical setting, mm -hmm. and it's about, for, for example, if we look at um, um, if we look at a civil war. Yes. If we have a civil war, we have to set the context. We have to say who is against who. Mm -hmm. We have to give some names of leaders. We have to describe some events. But that's part of the wider architecture. The story might be about how one family coped in that situation. So you have a family yeah. that's split. So you've got some brothers who are on one side and other brothers on the other side. So you've got the, the architecture, if you like, which is the civil war. And we have to tell the reader, we have to say, this is what the civil war was about. Mm. This was the um, the context. These were the leaders. So we described that, but not yeah. to the extent that it displaces the human element. The short story is about okay. the human dynamics. So what okay. you don't want is a history book, but with a couple of human elements within it um, as mm -hmm. a kind of afterthought. Yes? Yes, yes. So, but definitely... Thank you very much. You, you have to provide, as, as you say, you've got to provide the detail because otherwise people don't understand. You know, when, yeah, I, think yeah. about, when I think about the UK, um, we had the English Civil War when the, the, uh, the king of the UK had his head chopped off. And then we had um, a republic. We had a republic in the UK. So I look at that and I look at Cromwell and I look at the king and the history of it. But if I was writing a story, I'd have that as the, the architecture and I'd refer to it. But it would be about the humans in that situation because the English Civil War was a terrible time when mm. thousands and thousands of people were murdered. And you had these battles across the country. You had a republic, you had political instability, and so on. And, and you had a, a situation where the king of England, who at that time, he said, I am the king because God put me here. And Parliament said, no, we're in charge. And he said, I'm in charge. Oh. And they chopped his head off. In London, he had his head chopped off. So you've got the historical background and if I was going to write a history book on the English Civil War, I'd write about Cromwell, I'd write about the King, I'd write about Parliament. But if I'm writing about the human interest, a story or a novel, I wouldn't let the history mm -hmm. displace the human element. So you've got to, as you write, rightly suggest, Edith, you've got to have factual description because 
if you're writing for a foreign audience, something that you know about very, very well from school days, as I do from uh, my school days on the English Civil War, somebody outside the UK yeah. wouldn't know what on earth I was talking about. So I've got to provide some detail, some historical backdrop. Yeah? True, true. Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, shall we uh, move on? Context and environment. So um, this is where local knowledge really is a strength. By that, I mean, um, as a, an author, you have the unique ability to look at your immediate environment and to describe it. And people who are outside foreign audiences will read it and think, this is just amazing. So what we take for granted to others is very interesting. And I give you the example that uh, I went to Trinidad. I, I often go to Trinidad. And it amazes me because you're walking down the street and the trees are packed with these tiny green birds. And the colors of the flowers is breathtaking. So I'm walking down the street in Port of Spain with friends and I just want to stop. I just want to look at everything. It's just for me, it's a feast of color. I just cannot believe what I'm looking at. But for my friends, they're saying, what is wrong with you? Have you never seen a, a bright red flower before? Have you never seen green birds? And I say to them, no, I haven't. Not like this. So what they take for, for granted to me as a foreigner is just breathtaking. So when you're a, an author, you look at the world and you think, I can describe the, the scene, the colors, the sounds, the people, the way of cooking. Because it's second nature to me. I know everything about this, but a foreigner would not know. And on the next page, I give you, uh, we, we look at the next page afterwards, but I give you the link. There's a story on the platform by a writer, she's based in Mumbai in India. And she's written a story called Perfume. And it is amazing because it's so tightly written and the colors and the sounds and the cooking smells. It's as if you're standing next to the author. Now for her, it's just second nature. But for me, I find it amazing. So always look through your eyes at the world around you with all its beauty and all its ugliness. And you can write about both and it gives a sense of context. If you place a character in your story on a bus going through a place from A to B, uh, what does he or she see along the way? What um, can you say um, they can see through the window? Large crowds of people walking through streets, well-dressed people, walking quickly because they're worried about being attacked, perhaps. Speaking into mobiles because they're the new business elite. Maybe they're a little bit arrogant, full of their own self-importance. People going to low-paid jobs, students, people begging in doorways. So you've got a bus journey. Now, an author might say, somebody gets on the bus and they go, some, they go from A to B, and that's fine. But somebody else can provide a few snapshots. They don't have to be heavy handed. This is not a tourist guide. But in a handful of words, you can paint a picture. So we have a bus going down a dusty road and we're looking out and what can we see? The author has got the unique ability to describe context. Um, and of course, it gives social context. If there are people begging outside, it gives an idea of poverty. It gives an idea of wealth. What about the colors, the sounds, the smells when the person gets off the bus? 
when I first went to Trinidad and I got off the plane, I was hit in the face by a wall of heat. I couldn't believe it. I have never experienced heat like that. Humidity. So just in a couple of words, I could, ex I could describe my experience and I could describe climate. Just getting off a plane. Use minimal description, but enough to paint a picture. Have a look at this story, and here it, uh, it is. It's by an Indian author um, on the Yours to Read platform. And she's used the um, UK flag, but in fact, she's based in India. And I think if we look at the next slide, you'll see the link. Oh, there it is. Now, if you have a look at that, it's such a subtle story. It's so clever. I think some people, they, when they write a short story, they think that they have to write, write about very special, amazing people achieving amazing things, when often life is at its most interesting when it's at its most ordinary. When people are going about their ordinary day-to-day -day lives, the people they speak to, the local shopkeeper, this is what makes life interesting. A short story doesn't have to be of uh, a description of super people achieving amazing things. It is the mundane and the ordinary uh, which gives beauty to life. So all I'm saying is, with a short story, don't think it has to be outstanding or amazing. It might be a day in the life of a local cobbler. Somebody repairing shoes. Might be about his family. It might be about the people who come into his shop. It might be about a local politician he's known since school days. And this young man has gone on to politics and great things, but the cobbler has remained a cobbler. So you've got the intersection of lives. You've got the cobbler, the family, the politician, the judge, the lawyer, and you've got a focal point, the shop. Who comes in, who goes out? It's an ordinary setting. It doesn't have to be a palace. It doesn't have to be a parliament. It's an ordinary shop with ordinary people going about their lives, but it is so rich in what it has to say. Ordinariness can be so beautiful. Okay, shall we move on to our next? And the, the story in India is perfect. Uh, painting a picture of life in Mumbai. The author uses language in a subtle way. It's the inclusion of colors, sounds, smells, which give this story a uniqueness. And funny enough, there was a, uh, it's an Indian author, and there was a British author, and he posted a comment. He gave feedback. And he said about himself, he said, how dare I call myself an author when my work is not within so many miles of this amazing story? of ordinary people. So it's a great story. Have a little look at it. Uh, authors can capture these images from their everyday life, and although they take them for granted, for a foreign reader, they are unique because they give insight and images for the imagination. Some people, they have a habit of saying, I'm not going to write about this because it's too ordinary. People will find it dull. That's not the case at all. Write about things that you know about, that you're familiar with. And in the next paragraph, I, I tell you about uh, my trip to Trinidad. Um, as I say, the people in Trinidad, in Port of Spain, they see these things every day. But for me, they are amazing. So always draw upon your local experiences and your local environment and what you see. because foreign audiences will always find it uh, uh, very interesting. 
So, for example, um, there's a detective. So I've forgotten what the name is. Um, it's written by a guy called McCall Smith, and it's about a detective agency in, I think it's in Botswana. The Ladies Detective Agency in Botswana. You can check it on uh, Google. Um, and it has sold millions and millions of books. And it was made into a TV series here in the UK by the BBC. But it's about ordinary environments and people doing extraordinary things within it. So always, always look for inspiration from what's immediately in front of you. OK, shall we move on to our next uh, slide? Uh, local language, uh, local language and culture. Using local language or vocabulary is excellent if it helps to establish context. Words used or sentences must be translated in brackets alongside. Otherwise, the reader won't know what's going on. Um, references to local foods, methods of cooking, fruit, vegetables are all fine. Help paint a picture. Going back to the first paragraph. Uh, a while ago, and I don't think the author is in this room at the moment. An author who's a member of the Guild put in a, a short story and it was about political corruption. And it was a brilliant story. I really liked it. But I thought to myself, I better check this. So I copied the names and pasted them into Google. And I found that these were actual politicians in Kenya. I wrote back to the author and I said, you cannot, you cannot use these names because we're all going to end up in court being sued. He said to me, it's all true. This politician is corrupt and I have a right to say it. And I said to him, you don't. Uh, we must be careful not to use names of actual people uh, because we can end up in trouble uh, in court if it's not true. And even if it is true, we can still end up getting into trouble. So what I'm saying is avoid us using real names if the person is still alive. If the person is dead, then then maybe. But uh, then again, we, we have a saying that you should never say anything bad about dead people because they're not around to defend themselves. Yeah, <laughs> they can't answer back. Sorry, Simon, I need to jump in again. Sorry, yes, sorry, just um, yes, please do. I want to disagree or maybe to be guided. <laughs> yes, yes, no, disagree, please. I prefer that. <laughs> Okay, so I think, um, you know, what, what you have that the, the words or sentences must be translated. I read a lot of Caribbean novels, you know, you know, Diaz, uh, Gabriel Garcia, and they always have these Spanish words and they don't even care to translate. So uh, why should we translate? I mean, even if you look at the old uh, people like Zora Neale Hurston, the old um, Eng American English, they, they just, they don't translate and we have to like go Google ourselves. So why should we translate? Yeah, I mean, that that's very true. I mean, to be honest, um, I've had um, many stories coming through the Guild and they there's a sentence which is not translated. Mm -hmm. And I look at it and I think, that's great. I'd like to know what it means, um, but it's not, I guess it's not... Um, not so essential, but for a reader of a short story, the chances are they're going to say, what does it mean? So to some extent, when you don't translate, you're taking a bit of a liberty. You're, you're quite right that there are other authors that they don't. They don't translate it, and they, but they are taking a bit of a liberty because they're saying to the reader, you won't understand this. And quite honestly, I don't really care that you don't understand it, but I'm going to put it in anyway. So you're, you're taking you're taking a little bit of a liberty, but uh, I, as I say uh, I put it in it put in that it must be translated. I think it would be better if I said should be or could be rather than must. <laughs> <Okay>. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so I, I 
I certainly stand corrected by you, Edith, and you're right, and I'm wrong on this. I shouldn't have used the word must. So I guess it's a, it's a balance. You could put in some which is not translated and others which which are, yes? Yeah? So if it's, um, if somebody says, um, uh, for, for example, um, when, when I um, meet people from the Middle East, I usually say, Ahelen Kefalek. And that is, um, hello, how are you? It's a normal greeting. It's a bit like saying salam alaikum and so on. Now, yeah. if I put that into a book, I wouldn't translate it. But if I put in something um, more precise or detailed that was relevant to the story, then I'd probably put in a translation, yes? So for ordinary day-to-day okay. -day stuff like gestures and how are you and if somebody's saying, oh, it's been a terrible day, or I'm feeling really depressed today, and they put that in the local words, local vocabulary, and they don't translate it, I don't see there's any harm in that. But if the wording is important to the theme, the reader has got a missing piece of the jigsaw, yes? Yes. So if, if it's just general conversation, as I say, like, how are you? That's fine. Leave it as it is. But if it's relevant to the story, if it contains a fact, for example, then let's let's uh, translate it. And I think this is very uh, important for us as maybe Kenyan writers or African writers, because, you know, uh, more than being a means of communication, language is a carrier of culture. And there are some words that the English language does not adequately capture there's Absolutely. some experiences yes. that the English Absolutely. language will not capture yes. so in, in, you know, in such instances we find ourselves reversing to the use of our mother tongues to uh, convey a hundred percent what we mean. I think it's fantastic I, I really okay. do I think it's fantastic because it goes back to the idea of the story being genuinely a cultural reflection why should mm. words be changed yeah so it's a, it's a mix, I guess, as I say. I think I, I would pedal back on that word must, and I'd say if there's a, a factual element within that sentence, which is a key to the rest of the story, it should be. But if it's not, if it's all part of normal day-to-day -day conversation, leave it as it is, yes? All right, thank you very much. And And I think readers would like that. A reader would say, I don't know what that means, but why should I? This is about a, a cultural reflection. Yes? Mm -hmm. So a balance, as I say. If, it, if the sentence has got a key in it to the rest of the story, then let's translate it. But if it's general day-to-day -day conversation, let's leave it as it is. Why, why translate it? Uh, yep. Yes. OK. Um, Always keep in mind your target readership. If it's domestic audience, then write the entire uh, story focusing on local habits, customs, and so on. If it's a foreign audience, do this sparingly with just enough um, detail to create an atmosphere. So um, many of the stories that have come in through the Guild, they, they're so original and unique because it, they've got a balance. The author has written not just for the Kenyan audience, they've written for the foreign audience as well, and it works. If it was entirely for the Kenyan audience, fair enough. If it was entirely for the UK audience, fair enough. But if it's, if it's a cultural piece, then it shouldn't try to adapt. Yeah, the uniqueness of the story is in its language and culture, because as you say, when you look at the English language, it can be so clunky and lacking in subtlety and sensitivity. Yes. So let let's uh, let's use local language as well. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Yes. 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 It does. Okay. Let's have a look at our next uh, our next slide. Oh, how to start story, and this isn't set in concrete. It's uh, I'm I'm treading on very thin ice here because some people will look at it and they're going to say that's not the way to do it, and others will say yes, that's the way to do it. So, um, 
nothing is set in um, concrete. But having said that, you must capture the reader's interest in the first few paragraphs, or you've lost him or her, and he'll probably put the story on one side. And I think that's got to be true. With a long novel, if it starts off slowly, it's not a crime. It might pick up speed later on. But if it's a short story, you have to hook the reader fairly quickly. That's the nature of the genre, yes? You've only got maybe 20 pages. So you've got to catch the reader right at the beginning. And I've given you uh, an example here. The young man stood at the edge of the rooftop of the 20 story hotel building. One sentence. He looked down into the street below, watching the crowds. Two. He thought of his wife and his daughter. Three. What are they going to say? The investigation of the bank was drawing to a conclusion. Soon they would know what he'd done. Closed his eyes and jumped. So you've just got a few sentences there. You've got a young man on the roof, married, daughter, something has gone wrong in his life, and he's jumped. He's committed suicide. Now that's as a, as an opening paragraph. The reader is immediately thinking, who is he? What is this crime that he's supposed to have committed? Why is he so desperate? Why has he done this? Must be a pretty terrible crime because he's got a wife and a daughter and he said, it's not enough. I'm still going to jump off the roof. So it must be something pretty terrible. So within the first few sentences, we know something has gone terribly wrong in this man's life. So start off the short story. As I say, this isn't set in concrete. It's just a suggestion. But start off with something that immediately grabs the reader's attention. And there might be many different uh, reasons why he's up on the roof, but that's for the rest of the story. That's what it's all about. You're leading the reader in to the rest of the story. He's got to think to himself, yes, this is interesting from sentence one. I want to stick with it. Short stories, people become bored very quickly if you don't catch them at the beginning. So should we have a look? Yes, thank you. Less than 80 words for your complete story or the background to it. The central character is a family. Not enough for him, he's committed suicide. He's been involved in a crime. Either he works for the bank or he's a customer. How did he get into this mess? Also, is he correct? The twist in the tale may be that he was wrong. Perhaps he's mistaken. This may be the twist in the tale. Perhaps the crime had been committed by someone else. Perhaps the investigation would have found him innocent. Perhaps his wife was the criminal and he was covering up. For... So we digress. We go off in many different directions. There may be many explanations. It may be that the person wearing the loose clothes is wearing it for very good reasons because he likes loose clothes. But the whole important point is drawing in the reader. The opening paragraphs must inform or form a basis of the rest of the story. And for neatness, they must be linked back from the closing paragraph of the story. As I say, it's not set in concrete. These are just general suggestions as to the typical structure. OK, shall we have the next uh, next slide? Uh, how to these are about six minutes. These links are about six minutes long each, and they're worth having a look at. To some extent, they're stating the obvious, but have a little click through um, on how to start, because it's a, it's a devil of a job starting a new story, because you're sitting there, you're wandering around, and you're thinking, how am I going to start this? And I think it was Chairman Mao. He said, the first step is always half the journey because the first step is always the most difficult. 
once you've made it you can keep walking but making the first step is the difficulty and it's the same with a story or a novel you've got a blank page and you're thinking what on earth am i going to put on this and you write something you think no that's terrible you put it in the bin you write the next thing no no no, i don't like that put that in the bin or you delete it from the computer and by the end of the day you've written nothing at all is that a problem it isn't a problem because you're ruling out things so it's a good starting point knowing not what does not work is as important as knowing what does work so making mistakes uh, i was watching a program the other day and um, it was a politician a uk politician and he said this government will not make the same old mistakes he said we've got plenty of new mistakes to make <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's so true because you do things wrong and then you do it again and again and again but that's how we learn yes we make mistakes we get things wrong we start a short story we don't like it we scrap it and it's by ruling out things that we eventually come to something we think yes that's what works so a blank page who is going to step out of the mist who is the character you're going to create and what you're going to do with him or her so have a look at these links for the short story okay shall we see uh, our next bit about themes important that the short story has a few themes or strands running throughout it the story which wanders loses focus so that's another point about a, a short story the the um the book that i set in the second world war the uh, proofreader told me he said this is just wandering all over the place it's lacking focus i said well what are you telling me he said i think you should take out this chapter that chapter and that chapter i said to him i really like those chapters he said we're not concerned with what you like you're not writing for yourself you're writing for others take them out and i took them out so a story which wanders all over the place looks a bit of a mess maybe the opening paragraph is effectively the end of the story and the rest of the story goes back in time to describe how we got there so in the examples the young man is jumping off the roof the rest of the story says how did he get there the old man and the young woman how did they reach this point um um where he's comforting her the rest of the story may describe a loss a family which has been broken or whatever has to be some linkage so the the short story must be cohesive it must be neat although some people say a rough story with uh, jagged edges is a good thing as well as i say this is not set in concrete but remember you've got a limited space in which to um tell this story it's like a very small canvas that you're going to paint a portrait on so we have to be careful and concise okay do we have uh, our next slide and i think this might be our last slide uh, you have a choice when writing the conclusion to your story first you may use it to draw together the main themes and then link back to the beginning this is the usual way of going about it but a really good story is one which has a twist in the tale people like an unexpected ending where a reader says gosh i was never expecting that to happen it's probably a better approach it's more unique it's more creative uh, to give you an example a famous author here jeffrey archer wrote a story about a central character and its experiences and everybody thought it was a person it was only right at the end of the story that it turned out <clears throat> that the main person was not in fact a person at all but was a cat and it worked well so an unexpected ending is great because it gives the author freedom to give a surprise But leaving a story hanging in midair 
um, it's not a really good thing. I've I've read a number of stories lately where you get to the end and you say, well, what's next? And there isn't a what's next. And it's left kind of open ended. So for structure, short story would um, bring it to an end, a neat end. Although uh, you might say, well, we can have it open ended because um, the reader is left wondering what happened next. So to give you an example, let's say we have that old man and the young woman. And the last paragraph, it says the old man wiped a tear away from the young woman's eye. Full stop. That's the end of the story. And you think, oh. well, that's not good enough. Did they go home? Did they fly away? Did they live happily ever after? All you've told me is that he wiped her eye. But that may be a good enough ending in itself. So there are many different devices. OK, so any questions on what we looked at? Is everybody? Wow. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon, for making the discussion so practical and uh, taking us step by step. You know, in many cases, you'd find you know, you had uh, maybe someone telling you about all this, but the illustrations made it very easy to understand. I wrote so many notes that I think I have another presentation <laughs> from this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've really enjoyed it, and, I, and I, I've really enjoyed the, the interaction as well. It's been great fun, and I've learned a lot from you as well. So, so I thank you for, for your time. Yeah, so maybe I'll, before you go, I would wish to invite questions if anyone may be able, if anyone has any question. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, proceed. For example, in your short story, if yeah. you if you decide to, 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 to maybe quote lyrics, lyrics by a popular musician. Yeah. Uh, maybe thought lyrics. Do you, uh, is, um, are there any um, copyright issues? Do you need permission? For the extent? They, 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 yes, there they can be. There can be copyright issues. You're quite right. But what people don't like is um, when you plagiarize. And plagiarism is when you copy somebody else's work or ideas and pass it off as your own. So that is um, that's something which uh, is is frowned on. But on your question about a copyright, the answer is yes. There may be copyright issues. You cannot go reproducing somebody's lyrics without their permission. Okay. Okay. But, Thank you uh, very much. For that. As I say, the thing, to, the thing to be careful about is plagiarism. That that really is um, a problem when somebody is copying somebody else's work without attributing it. If you copy a piece of work and you say Hemingway said the following, bum 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 bum, that's okay because you're not trying to claim credit for it. But passing off other people's work as your own is when we get into trouble. And thank you. Gimi Nzioki is asking, what is the typical word count of a short story? Is there a typical international standard for the same? Well, that, that's, um, that's the, the question in another way. To put it in another way, how long is a piece of string? It depends. So you can have... Um, there was a, a story that was submitted a while ago that was uh, rejected. And the, the author wrote in, and I think he put in something like, um, once upon a time, um, there was a family. They all lived together and uh, lived happily in the end. And I rejected it. He said, I was only putting it in for a joke. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> I said, the readers won't find it particularly funny. I said, it's, uh, <laughs> it's too short for starters. 
So there is no set limit. And to, to, to look at it a different way, you can have a short story of maybe a dozen pages or a few thousand words, which is so moving and emotionally sen sensitive. And it's great. You really feel as if you've had a good meal. But then you can have another story, which is 30 pages long, and you feel as if you've just had a packet of chips in, in McDonald's because <laughs> it, it's just not satisfying at all. So I put it to you in a different way. It's not the length of the story that matters. It's the content. And there isn't a standard uh, length of story. Jeffrey Archer is um, a magician when it comes to short stories. He has sold hundreds of millions of books. He's brilliant. But his short stories are tens of thousands of words long. You know, when you think that an MBA dissertation is between 15 and 20,000 words long, uh, his short stories are sometimes 20,000 plus. <laughs> but then you have others which are just a few thousand words. But you really want to think, am I giving the reader a good meal here? or just a snack. <laughs> so I, I would aim for somewhere around 15, uh, 15 pages, so maybe 5,000, somewhere around there, 5,000, 10,000 words. That, that's a nice length. But as I say, it's not the length, it's the substance which matters. So perfume is quite a short story, but it's very powerful. Thank you. Well answered. Eh? So are you giving your reader a meal or a snack? That was stood out. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Now, where, where do you draw the line between um, a short story and a novella? Oh, again, that's, that's, a, that's a tricky one. Um, to, to, to maybe put it a different way, what um, we're hoping with, with the Yours to Read platform. Um, yes, I have a question. Ah, oh, please, yes. Oh, let, let, I'll, finish the, I'll finish that first question about the um, short story and the novella. Um, the, the platform is aimed because the, the view here is that everything has become so fast. People want things so quickly. They, they're fast consumers. They want to buy a burger and eat it on the on the train by the time they arrive home and whatever. So the aim of the platform is to make, uh, to give short stories that can be read in a short space of time. Now, to give you an example, in the heart of London, in Canary Wharf, there are uh, these machines in the street and they produce ticker tapes. So you press a button and you can decide whether you want a story that takes five minutes to read 10 minutes, half an hour, you press a button on the machine and it literally produces a strip of paper with a story on it, a randomly selected a piece of paper, which I think is environmentally um, unsatisfactory. But anyway, um, so you've got different types of stories, different lengths. So the aim of the, the Yours to Read platform is to have stories that can be read in a reasonable space of time. When I think of a novella, I think about something I have to read and then come back to later, unless I'm on a long train journey. A short story is something that can be read in a short space of time. As I say, maybe waiting for a train or an aeroplane. That's what this is aimed at. So the Yours to Read platform has had stories coming in um, that are very long we've had some that look more like novellas but as a general rule we prefer a short story which is one which can be read um in half an hour maybe somewhere around that but as i say a novella is really something which uh you read over a period an extended period of time but as you rightly imply it's different from a full novel which will take you even longer so the short story you read it quickly, short space of time. Novella, you probably come back to it the next day. The novel, you read it over a week. Okay. So I must apologize for that 
uh, answer which lacks accuracy, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Well put. And uh, Edith is asking, what are the emerging trends, if any, in short story writing? Um, that's that's a difficult one. I think the short story um, is the same across generations. People have been writing short stories for you know as long as there have been humans on the planet. But it's not so much the production of the short story which is changing; it's the consumption of it. So people expect with short stories to have something that they can access through any technology and that they can read quickly if they want a book they'll buy a book on amazon if they want something extended to take on holiday with them they know where to look the short story today um, is aimed at consumers who want something fairly quickly they go into uh, starbucks or they go into gatwick airport and they've got a cup couple of hours to to pass so they buy a uh, a latte in their starbucks and they think am i just going to sit here and watch other people walking back and forward in the in the airport or am i going to read something while i'm here and i can read a newspaper or i can read a short story and that's where i think there's a gap so to go back to your question edith i don't think it's so much the writing of the short story it's the consumption it's the way in which it's delivered and what uh, readers are demanding these days. Maybe just to give um, context to the question. Yes, please do. Um, can I give context to the question? Yes, definitely, definitely, please. So um, in reading a, a lot of short stories and, and even a flash fiction now, I see um, there are stories that do not even have punctuation marks so you read a story from the beginning to the end and yes there is no full stop there is no there's nothing i don't know if you've read a girl woman yes Adam. i have i know I that's have a novel it. yes but i'm seeing it a lot in short stories now and flash fiction so are those like emerging trends i i'm i'm not sure that they're an emerging trend in the sense of displacing the short story i think they're more on the periphery so we've got flash fiction on the yours to read platform and I think we could open up to flash fiction in which the normal rules on punctuation and grammar can go out the window. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a gap for it, but I can't see the short story disappearing or merging into flash fiction where the normal rules uh, of punctuation do not apply. There's definitely space for flash fiction. And there's a particular type of consumer for it. I mean, there's work on the platform, which I, it's not really my cup of tea. Um, for example, we've got science fiction on the platform. We've got horror on the platform. Now, neither of those genres appeal to me at all. I look at it and I think, oh, I find them not not very interesting but that's just me there's obviously a demand for it and there's a gap in the market so there's a gap in the market for flash fiction and for stories that are written without the normal rules but what i hope with this platform is that we focus on the short story um in in the usual construction where it's proper in, in terms of grammar and, uh, and punctuation. You know? So it's something that lasts the, the test of time. The so short stories that we have on the platform, they will last for years, even though they're written by uh, authors who are doing it for fun. They're not professional authors, but these stories will last for years. Flash fiction is just that. It's just a flash. It will be here today and it will be gone tomorrow. It's like uh, a story written on a hamburger wrapper. You can read it, but the wrapper will end up in the bin and nobody will ever remember it. But uh, to go back to your, your point, Edith, there's definitely a kind of fragmentation on the short literature side where we have the short story in its traditional format. 
we have other short stories where, as you say, it's just without any punctuation at all. And we have the flash variety, where it's literally maybe a couple of paragraphs. Thank you. Okay, so... Does that answer your question, Edith? Are you happy with that? You happy? Okay, thank you. Are you, you, you happy? happy with yes? Okay. Okay, Thank you're you. welcome. Thanks yes. for the question. Okay, so I think we we should be we we should be concluding shortly, but I would ask that you may be able just if there is something you'd wish to mention in the site, or maybe a direction or something you'd wish to mention regarding the site, especially the bit of getting paid when your story is downloaded. I think this is of great interest to the writers who are here. And the site yes. is projected. Yes, thank, thank you for mentioning that, Gabriel. Um, uh, I've, got, I've got mixed um, feelings about, uh, about uh, answering that because what I didn't want to do was to come to this workshop um, uh, like a traveling salesman and to say, this website is the best thing that you will ever, ever come across, and you must get on to it. I didn't want to come, come here and, and make a sales pitch. I wanted to, to have a conversation. I wanted to learn from you uh, and to present my slides. So I'm not going to say much about the platform because you can visit it yourself. But as Gabriel rightly says, what we've now got is a payment facility within the site which allows authors to set a price for their work. So um, the, the method of payment, I think, is uh, PayPal. Uh, we did try using Stripe, but it's PayPal. Now, the next question that somebody might well ask is, how much um, do you get or how much does the author get and how much does the site get on the, the royalty? And the answer is, the author takes 100% of the royalty. We don't actually receive anything because PayPal does not allow or does not enable split royalty, as does the so-called Stripe system. So if you use the site um, to um, sell your work, then all the proceeds go directly to you. Now, looking further ahead, and I don't mean in the next week or the next couple of weeks, what I would like to do is to move in the direction of possibly um, yours to read, um, acting for authors, promoting their work here in the UK. So what I've got in mind is um, packages of stories that will be offered to subscribers. So in other words, we have a subscriber in Manchester, Glasgow or wherever, and they will subscribe for, let's say, a month, and they will pay a fee. And for that, they will get maybe 10 stories or 15 stories um, fired to their mobiles or their laptops or whatever. Now, at that point, Yours to Read will be able to take a fee because they'll, they'll have a subscription model. Um, they'll be s selling a bundle of stories. Uh, all authors within the bundle get a percentage of it and yours to read will take a percentage, but we're not at that stage yet. And it will involve significant investment uh, to enable the website to provide that facility. So as I say, it might be the case that we'll be coming back to um, authors through the guild and asking, are they interested in appointing us to market their stories here in the UK? But that's some distance off. We're not at that point at the moment. So for the short term, uh, Kenyan authors can sell their stories, both uh, to Kenyan readers, but also to readers in the UK. They can do it via the website and they, uh, they take 100% of the royalty, but it will be in their hands to promote the story. In other words, through their Twitter accounts and, and whatever and also asking friends and family to download the story from the website to attract other readers' attention. But uh, I'm very pleased with uh, the payment facility because we did a test run on this um, about a week ago, and there was a member of the guild 
two members and I asked them to put their stories up for sale on the website and I downloaded it. I bought the stories and it was amazing technology because they uploaded the story in the morning. I downloaded it at, at midday and I paid and they received the money in their account in the afternoon. Well, this is just amazing technology that you can have an author in Nairobi uploads a story into the platform at nine o'clock. At 10 o'clock, somebody in Paddington, London downloads it. And 12 o'clock, the author in Nairobi receives a credit into their PayPal account. I think that technology is absolutely incredible. Um, but for authors getting paid for their work, it's certainly something that I would invite you to have a little look at. But uh, I have no vested interest in it because, as I say, we don't receive any fees ourselves. But please uh, make use of it because it's it's there for you to earn uh, money for your stories. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, um, I'll have to request and be able to, uh, you know, share uh, later on because there is a WhatsApp group that we have set up uh, for all of us. The people who wish to uh, grow more and share resources regarding short stories, there is a WhatsApp group that we've put together, which Writers Guild and uh, us to read will be sharing resources and providing guidance so that you can be able to write more short stories and uh, ex explore platforms through which you can be able to sell them or you can be able to get them published and uh, earn from it, which you truly deserve. So we shared the link of the platform Thank at you. the chat. You may be able to check and then you follow and join the WhatsApp group where the further conversation will go on. But for now, because of time, I'll, I'll, I'll really have to ask you to help me thank Simon. But before then, I'll ask him if I can be able to give him 30 seconds or so to just give his concluding remarks. Then we can be able to finish our session for today. OK, well, okay for the concluding remarks, um, I'd just like to thank Gabriel for being um, such a, a, a great colleague. It's um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be working with Gabriel, and I, I'm very grateful to him. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody in the Guild for having posted stories to the website. They have been excellent. And if you look at the feedback that you've received for some of your stories, um, you will see that the UK readers have really enjoyed them as well. So um, I'm very grateful to you. And I hope you will continue posting, uh, posting work to the website because your work enriches the website and it makes uh, the project worth worth doing. So I'm very grateful to you and I'm very grateful to you for this workshop and for uh, your conversation. And I've learned a lot from you. So thank you again. And uh, I hope uh, you keep safe and you keep healthy and you stay away from crowded places. As you know, the UK is in a bit of a terrible state at the moment. I hope it'll pass soon enough. Uh, but I wish you all good health. And um, please keep in touch. Uh, please keep posting to the website. And uh, anytime you want to send me an email uh, with any questions, or even if it's just to say hello, um, I will welcome it. Any, any communication will be brilliant. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Keep safe. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we are really grateful to have the partnership and to have you lead this session. As I noted, uh, and I think I'm talking on behalf of many other people, uh, you made the session in a way that it was very practical and someone would be able to follow or will be able to get grasp what you, you are saying in regards to the short story. So I'm, on, I'm hoping that we can be able to do more of this and our partnership between us to read and Writers Guild is making this better. So I was going to mention at this point that every month we will be having a workshop on short stories, which we will facilitate together 
or we will the modalities of facilitation will be communicated later but it will be done in collaboration with uh, yours to read so we'll invite you for this and also i've invited you all for the to the whatsapp group that we have created where we can be able to keep the conversation going and also to keep sharing resources and uh, opportunities that can be able to help us earn and write more write well in short stories so i invite you to both and wish you all the best in all that you do so our initial plan was to have uh, patricia i don't know if patricia is there if you can be able to just give us a brief presentation of what you had prepared earlier just brief it would take three minutes then we'll be able to conclude and go so patricia are you there ah uh, here i am okay uh, so I wanted to present on friendship and caring for each other during this period of coronavirus. Uh, as you know, right now, all of us are in the house and you can't go and visit your friends. So I just want you to be concerned about your friends. Don't wait for them to reach out to you before you can reach out to them. Talk to them. Some don't, you know, most of the people were laid off from their jobs. They don't have anything at this moment in time please just check on what, how they're doing if you have something small if you're that lucky to have a little bit if you can share please with other people that you feel like they'll need it i think it will be a good gesture uh, another thing you can also find a common topic that you can talk with them there's whatsapp where you can do video calls and everything so um, check on them on whatsapp and find a topic that you can talk together or share some of the resources. If you have resources that you feel like it can benefit them, please share with them and everything. And it was a big presentation, but for now I'm going to stop it over there. And friends, it doesn't mean people in your age gap alone. It means also the elderly, which are very um, prone to this one, uh, to Corona. Uh, so you can also look around if there is elderly people you can reach out to and talk to them and ask how they're doing and, and everything. And if you have a friend in isolation, I have two friends who tested negative or positive, I mean, so please send them. I'm using this one, but please, what I've been doing with them, I've been sending them very funny videos and everything so that to cheer them up they don't feel they're alone and everything i try to send them very funny stuff and so that they don't feel like they're alone and avoid uh misinformation so as a writer you are the right person to actually know what you're sharing other people are going to read so please find verify your information before you share them look after yourself to look after us all that's all for today Wow. Thank you very much, Patricia, for reminding us what we can be able to do during this time for our friends and our families. Uh, you know, before we are a writer, we are a human being. And now we have this problem that is around us and is, has affected some of the things that we do. So it is good to adjust to it, as Patricia said, but most of all also in line with our theme for the year, of growing friendships and families. We check on each other, we check on our, our, our fellow writers so that we, we keep each other company. So thank you very much, Patricia, for the reminder. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. At this point, I would wish to ask you if any of you has any announcement that they would wish to make, uh, you may be able to switch on uh, to unmute your microphone and feel free to communicate to others before we close any announcement maybe a writing opportunity somewhere or um an event or something interesting you'd wish to communicate with others anything from your end you may be able to take this chance anyone Okay, so there being no one with a question. Um, uh, <coughs> okay, I can see Hassan is saying thank you. 
we are grateful and i think simon deserves our appreciation so thank you thank you everybody <laughs> thank you very okay. much okay have a good weekend and we'll be in touch gabriel all the best thank you very much everyone all the bye -bye. best bye bye, bye. The best way to leave would be to switch on your video and say hi as you go. <laughs> but we are done for today and we are grateful. Next week we will have another session on uh, the, the, the topic will be freelancers paradise. So we'll be sharing about all it takes to be a freelancer and some of the things that you can be able to do to be more effective as you freelance or as you write with no specific commitment to any any setup you are not writing for any unit in specific so you write for many people freelancers paradise so we'll be able to share more information on the same but otherwise thank you very much for today you are free to leave <laughs> thank you bye bye